Cool. Uh, as Tim said, I'm Jared, the developer at Atlassian. Um, just a bit of history to this talk. I was forced into it by Jay. <laughs> um, I'm not an expert in NoSQL or SQL in any way, so if I get anything wrong, please tell me and we'll go from there. Um, so I'm just going to cover what NoSQL is first. Uh, if there's any DBAs in the room, can you please leave? Um, I don't want things thrown at me or stabbed. So, so what is it? Um, it's all in the name, really. Uh, when I say the word SQL, what comes to mind? Consistency. <laughs> Fair enough. I was kind of hoping for like words like relational, schema, query language. Basically, it does away with all that. Um, I, this quote is from a guy named Jan, who's a core contributor to CouchDB, who works for Couchbase. Um, so NoSQL is not about any one feature of any one project. NoSQL is not about scaling. NoSQL is, about, is not about performance. NoSQL is not about hating SQL. NoSQL is not about ease of use. NoSQL is not about sharding. NoSQL is not about throughput. And you can read the rest. These are the ones that I think are important. Scaling, ACID, eventual consistency, CAP, open source, and choice. Choice is the most important, I think. With, no, uh, with SQL, you're sort of lumped into the three major vendors, MySQL, SQL Server, or the large Oracle. Uh, yeah. Scaling. Generally comes under two terms, vertical, it's how it used to be done. You bought bigger and bigger machines until you eventually hit that sweet spot and your CPU was not on fire anymore. Or horizontal scaling, where uh, we're in Google, they're sort of the king of this. They buy commodity hardware and just scale out quite well. I think the term that a lot of people use is web scale. So horizontal scaling is sort of where NoSQL comes in. It, it, it doesn't buy into the, uh, the, the, the usual parlance of throw more RAM at something until the problem stops. Cap. Has everyone, anyone heard of this before? So it's, it's basically a theory that says you've got the choice of consistency, as Tim said. So your data is consistent. So basically what, what the theory says is systems suck. They're going to fail at some point. What can we do to, to mitigate this? So it can either, either be consistent. Once, it's, once something starts failing, you can guarantee that the data is still going to be consistent. It can still be available. It may not get there at, at the right time, but it's going to get there. The, the system is always going to respond, and not with a 500. It's going to respond in a good way. Or it can be petition to tolerant, so that we can take out a node, and it, that, that node can still start serving requests. And when it does come back up, all the data is gets spread out through your system. Basically, what the CAP theorem says is pick two of these. Sort of, so availability and petition tolerance, that's sort of Redis. That's sort of like the Python darling of the NoSQL world. RDMS sort of sit on the side, they're always available and they're consistent, mainly because they don't really shard. And CouchDB, the one we're here to talk about is over here, consistency and petition to tolerance. Choice. NoSQL comes with lots of choice. There's so many databases, there's so many different types of databases. We've got but they generally fall under three general types, and we'll cover those in detail a bit more. Um, but again, a lot of these straddle more than one different type. They, they're sort of hybrids of them. They're, they're, depending on who you talk to, there could be hundreds of different types of, of no, NoSQL databases. One of the big ones is a graph database. Uh, it borrows from the idea of graph theory, so each you've got nodes and your edges. Um, it, it basically says that the relationships between nodes is just as important as the nodes itself. So think, think Facebook, you've got your friends, but the, how you know that friend is just as important as the friend itself. So that's where the edges come in. So we've got here, uh, Thomas Anderson knows Trinity for three days. Can you imagine trying to do that in a SQL database? You'd have to set up a linking table, a, a, a table that divides the relationships, the linking table to your nodes. It sort of starts to muddy uh, your, your architecture. It becomes less clear of what's actually going on when you're looking at the schema. Key value store. This is sort of the big one. Uh, mem memcache is the big one. It's an in, in, in store mem, uh, in store key value pair store. So you 
give it a string and store a string. And that's all it does. It just stores heaps of these, and they're quite good at that. Um, React is another famous one. It uses a cyclic buffer to shard out its uh, data source. And then we come to the one that CouchDB is, the document store. It's sort of the most structured of all the three different types. Um, Lotus Notes is a classic example of this. <laughs> um, so yeah, you're, you're basically storing documents. So, so think you know, a, a record in a phone book, that's an, a, a wiki page, something like that. Something that's got a bit of structure to it. But And then we come to CouchDB. Uh, um, so yeah, as I said, it's a document store. Uh, it's written in Erlang, which is a, like a highly scalable functional language. Uh, came from uh, the telecom world, Siemens wrote it. Um, it's written by a guy named Damien Katz, who is quite famous for what? Lotus Notes. <laughs> uh, we shouldn't hate him for that too much, but... <laughs> uh, so he basically, when he left uh, IBM, I think it was at the time, he self-funded himself for two years and, and came out with CouchDB. Um, so we'll get into what CouchDB is now. Uh, as I said, it's a document store. It uses JSON to store its um, documents. Uh, does everyone know what JSON is? For those that don't, I didn't really pay attention. Was the, uh, it's the JavaScript ob object notation. So it's basically this is a JavaScript object represented, uh, serialized basically. Uh, there's two things on there that are important to note. It's one is the ID. That's the ID of that document. It's ca it, c it can be automatically generated or you can specify it. It has to be unique across your uh, database. Then the revision. I'll get into why the revision is important uh, in some slides. It's schemaless, meaning you can avoid this. You've all been there. You've, it's, as your application's grown, you know, more requirements get added. You've had to add another table. You've had to link tables here and here and here. And then suddenly you get this mess. It's just, you can't understand it anymore. So uh, a, a, good, a good way to uh, sort of differentiate this is, think, think of a phone bill. You've got an Optus phone, you've got a Telstra phone. They're two of the same type of document, but they will display very different data. So there, there is a logical grouping, but there may not be, in, uh, in the, re the records may not be the same across the two, two documents. So, yep. so yeah. Um, as I said, it's petition, uh, petition tolerance. It employs something called master-to-master -master replication. This is quite, uh, I think Oracle is, is the same. It, basically what it means is that every single node in, in your, uh, so one database in your, in your network is fully capable of answering con contention questions about anything else. So it, it can come offline, up, answer any question about any merge conflicts that come in. It can then come back up and it will distribute to every single other node in the database. It will handle any conflicts for you, no problems, uh, although you can provide a function that will answer these questions for you as well. Um, sorry. Yep. So the good thing about this is that you could potentially store your database on a phone. It could lose network. As soon as it gets network access again, it can replicate out to the, to the, to the network again, and suddenly, Every node in your database knows about everything else there. Conflicts and merge are handled for you um, using something called eventual consistency. So uh, a lot of people think that eventual consistency is, is a problem. I don't see how it is because to me, every database is eventually consistent. Take, take for example the fact that some idiot drives their forklift into your warehouse. Your database isn't going to know about that for some time because they're going to be putting out fires and dealing with the problem. So every database is eventually consistent. So you really should be coding for this anyway. So it's not so much of a problem. What I mean by eventual consistency is that CouchDB promises that at some point every database will be consistent. It could be three hours from now or it could be a, a second from now, but it will be consistent. Uh, it does mean you have to think things through. like you. It does mean that your ID, like, to make your, yeah. so th think of the situation where you've got usernames. They have to be unique. How do you deal with that if a, a, net, uh, a node is down? So you've got to think about these things in advance, but that's not so much a problem. You should be thinking about those things anyway. It's fast. It trades 
it trades right perform it, it trades right performance for right performance if that makes sense. Basically, it's a lockless algorithm, meaning that it never locks the disk to, uh, to write a document. It because it never has to update a document. So basically, when a write comes in, it just writes it to the disk. It just creates a new record and updates that revision number that we saw before. Um, which means it never has to sit around waiting for some someone else to finish with that record. It just dumps it there, and when when that record's finished reading it, it then updates the so. So then that one updates, updates the revision record to point to the new one, and, that's, and the old one is still pointing to the old one, so it's reading a consistent state, if that makes sense. Did that confuse anyone? No? OK. Uh, CalCV is one of the only NoSQL databases that can conform to ACID, which is uh, autonomy, consistency, uh, isolated, and I can never remember D, durability. And that's because of what I said before, because it's, cause it's writing a, a unique document. It doesn't have to read anything. It doesn't have to wait for anything. It just writes. As long as that write succeeds, it. As long as that write uh, sorry. As long as that write succeeds and it can update that uh, that that revision, then everything's fine. If it doesn't, it's got a. It's got a. Uh, it's yeah. Sorry. It's got a, just got a document sitting there with no revision pointing to it. Eventually, the, the, the database will clean it up for you and remove it from the disk, and everything, ha uh, everything goes fine, as always. So CalCV is managed through HTTP. It uses a, a REST sort of style to do this. So your, your normal CRUD is done through uh, HTTP. So create is done by a put. Read is done by a get. Update is done by a post, and delete is done by a delete, uh, the HTTP verbs. Um, so it, it takes the form of database and the document ID, or the view ID. So if we just show an example of that. Sorry, the keynote's really bad. If you put the menu bar on this one, which I need it to be, it, it puts the speaker notes on that one. I, so, um, so sorry about this. But so the first thing we need to do is create a database. Can you read that? So we're just going to use curl, just a normal HTTP tool. And then we get a response back in JSON saying, that's OK. Well, I've created that database for you. And if we want to get information about that database, we just simply get. And you can get all types of information there. Update sequence deleted, uh, what time it was created, how big it is on disk, is it is, has it been compacted, is a compaction running? So as I said, it, it updates each document which means you can potentially get a lot of garbage because you've got a lot of old revisions sitting on disk. So compaction will run either at a set time by you or uh, whenever it feels, it, whenever it's running out of disk, it will run a compaction. Two mics. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and just clear up those old revisions for you. Um, ag again, you can specify a function to tell it how to do this and what to, what to delete, what not to delete. So we then want to put something into that database. So we're just going to put an empty document in. And there we go, we created a document. Uh, it's got the ID, which is just a hash, and then the revision, which again is just a hash with a, generally, it, uh, if you're not messing with the revisions, it will just update this, this one here. And then to query it, we can just do a get on the all documents. And it should return us one document. Total rows one, offset rows, and then the rows in the database. So you can do it that way. Sorry. I seem to have lost my dot. Or CouchDB ships with something called Futon. Play on name there, I guess. Um, 
which is a, just a web, it, it, it's, a, it's actually a couch app. So it's the couch maintenance tool written in couch, a bit recursive, but it does everything we just did. So if we go to MyDB, you can see that there's our revision. We can add a field, as I said, it's schema, so we can just add whatever we need to. Save document, and as I said before, it keeps the old version there, so you can still refer to it, and then just creates a new document. So anyone that was writing to the database then would have, bit st would have been pointed to that old one. We created the new one. When that write finishes, it just then updates to point to the new one. Um, The which? The revision field the database. Is that uh, it, it is, but you can also write functions to give it your own. So it, as long as it's unique, it won't care. I'm not exactly sure what happens if it's not unique. I'm sure that bad things will happen. <laughs> kind of like, yeah. Uh, as I said, master to master replication, it's actually ridiculously easy. Anyone who ever tried to set up replication in the SQL world, yeah, not fun. Uh, we literally just go. Uh, continuous means that it's continually doing it, not just, so you can specify when a replication happens or you could um, set continuous and it will, whenever that node has downtime, it will just start replicating out for you. We hit replicate. It says we're gonna create a second database. It says okay. And if all went well, we should have It's compacted the database so we don't have a previous revision, but as you can see, that's as easy as it is for replication. You can set as many as you want and it will do just replicate out between each of the nodes. One of the other cool things about this is design documents. So design documents is a relatively new feature of CalCV, but it, it, if you think about it, a HTML file is a document, a JS file is a document, a CSS file is a document, and this is serving files over HTTP. So why can't we just serve these out of the database? So you can actually create your entire application from within CalCV, and it will happily serve it. Serve your index file as a document, and then the JavaScript is a document, and all you're doing is talking to the, to the database. So yes. Um, I would hope I had one, but I don't. Um, as easy as that is, so it's just the database name, the hash of the docu do document we're trying to access, and then the name of the attachment to that file, and it's serving a HTML file. So you can do that with JavaScript, CSS, and you can basically uh, host your entire app inside CalCB, which is quite an amazing feat, I think. Um, there is an application called uh, CalChap that will allow you to mirror the contents of the document database to the uh, file system, and then all you have to do is just modify the JavaScript files and the HTML files in so on the file script, I basically do the equivalent of a git push and it pushes it up to your couch db database and that's it. So that means that you're suddenly web scale because you can farm this out across multiple nodes, across multiple networks and everything works fine. Um, yeah. So now we've got data in our database. How do we get it back out? How do we add like consistency as someone said? How do we ensure that the data we're getting out is consistent in the way we want and indexed so it's retrieval is quick? It's done through in the no. In the CalCB world, it's done through something called views. Uh, does everyone sort of know JavaScript here to some extent? Can you write a function? Then you can write a CalCB view. It's that simple. So let's say we were we were storing your day-to-day -day life inside CouchDB. We, had a, we have a document with a field called activity. We want to make sure that, we want to basically index every speaking activity that I have to do in the next couple of weeks. 
So for every document inside CouchDB, it calls your view. It gets past the document doc. Each field is then just a property inside that document. So we just here all we're doing is checking if the activity exists on the document. If that activity is named, if it has a string of speaking, if it does, we call the emit, emit function, which emits a key. Um, so this is just a key value pair. So we're emitting, we're telling CouchDB that I want to emit a key, which is a date of when that occurs. I hopefully am not speaking on two days at once, so it's a fairly unique key. You want to be a little bit smart about your keys just to make sure they are unique and indexable. Um, and then the value is the entire document. So if we scale very well. Did everyone read that? So here I am, I'm doing pretty much what I did before, a few different names, but same sort of thing. Um, and it's outputting every single, uh, it's, it's outputting a key value pair of everything where I have a speaking engagement coming up. Uh, it just has a lot of today because I needed some data. Um, yeah, so uh, these can be as complex as you want. You can skip things. It will, in, it will run it, the only caveat is it will run it across your entire database once. Each new, each new document that's inserted into the database, will get, it will get run up and just uh, added to the index. So it, it is only an upfront cost. Um, just be a little bit smart about it. You can composite keys. You can do it just by returning array as your key. Um, you then query using the, just the query string, so you can sort ascending, descending just by putting the sort ascending uh, as a query string. Uh, the DB key, uh, actually I think it's called, uh, the attribute will let you return a specific key from the database, which will return that value. Um, so that's sort of how you, you query your databases through these views. Um, the other thing is that you can also reduce, so map reduce, you can reduce your functions to one value. So think of, Think of tags, do we have any? Sorry, I was messing with it last night and I probably shouldn't have been and I broke a bunch of stuff. Um, so, uh, so imagine we had some tags in our database, you know, uh, just a, an array of tags. So for today's event, we'd have Python, SciPy, and CouchDB as our tags. If we wanted to get a list of every, uh, how many tags are associated with our uh, database, we would write a view function that pulls all those views out as a, and just emits them as a key value pair of Python and a, and a one. Then we would write a reduce function that would look, Uh, so all it does is then iterates over those and adds the sum of each of those values. So you get given the key and the value, and you just simply add them up, and it will return you a list of all the. So they do have two, two parts. Uh, you don't have to use a reduce, but the, it is there if you need to do any sort of aggregate functions across your data. Um, back to the. Now we get to the part we're all here for, Python. Um, it's, as you've seen, it's all JSON and HTTP, so you could quite easily write your own wrapper using URL of two and simple JSON. But that seems like it's reinventing the wheel. Surely someone else has done it for us. There's multiple libraries out there. There's uh, Python CouchDB. Um, I much prefer using one that's called uh, CouchDB Kit. It sort of closely mimics uh, CouchApp. Sort of, you can store things on the file system and push them to your database in your code. 
Uh, it makes much more sense to me. And so I'm just going to give a quick demo of that now. This is going to be very awkward. Zoom in text mate. Did everyone read that? Nope. All right. Yeah, it doesn't work. <laughs> okay. Uh, so who has used Django? You've all obviously seen something similar to this event class up the top here. You sort of just so we provide sort of a, like an ORM for CalCB. Um, so you extend from the document class and just set up your properties. Um, you then access the server. Just sort of know, it sort of guesses and you can provide arguments if you need to. Uh, then you call get or create DB. Uh, DB. So we're pretty self-explanatory. Um, I hope I don't need to explain that one. We then tell it what our model, what, the, what database it lines up to. So we, this line here, we tell it you know, this event class maps to this database so when you do anything you need to help there. Um, then you just create a, a class, pretty simple, and then call save. I don't think I need to explain that. The only thing that probably does need explaining, as I said, this is Python, this is also Couch. We don't have schemas, we don't have strongly typed objects. We can then just extend out and save again, and it will push it up there for us. Um, yeah. There's nothing much to it. Does, is that all self-explanatory? Um, as I said before, it um, it allows you to pull things from the file system and uh, and push them up to your server. So if we use this un this comment right here, you just give it a path to your view and the DB that you want to push that to, and it will upload it to your server. Uh, I've got an example of that when I showed it. Django integration. Um, but then all you do is call speaking event. Um, ah, it doesn't. It, do it doesn't have a view named that. Um, that's why. This is what you get for messing with your demo at 12 o'clock last night. Uh, so what that should have done is pulled anything with the speaker title and loop through it, and that's as simple as that. You just. Um, but I think the, the, where the true power of uh, CalCB comes in is through when we start using. So it's got fairly powerful um, Django uh, integration. It actually replaces its ORM 
So you can do just what we did before. You give it a document uh, as instead of giving it the, the model. And you can hook up to your CatchDB database that way. Um, I do have an example of that. And we'll just go through the, through the code. So, um, if we go back to the code, just it's just your standard Django app. You've got your app, and you've got your settings, blah blah blah. Um, uh, nothing real special in here. We've just got a separate setting for the CouchDB database and the database server that we want to talk to. Um, if you if you need load balancing, there are plenty of uh, third-party libraries out there for it. Um, but just in this case, we're just going to point to one database. And then we just uh, add the CouchDB Django um, uh, app. Then we go to models.py, standard Django. The only thing different here is that we import the uh, schema and give it a document instead of the model, uh, as you normally do. And then you've got this class meta, which just links the database to the model, as we did before. The good thing about this is it's now suddenly compatible with the rest of Django, so you can give it your Django form as we've done here. So we've events form. Uh, you've all seen that in Django before. Does anyone need an explanation of that? It's basically just saying this form is going to display using reflection, get the type and sort of display uh, an applicable form so you don't have to write all the HTML for you, it just sort of does it for you. Um, yeah. Yeah, but it, it it sort of prefers to use a SQL database there. Um, sort of people sort of recommend that you just take the best of both worlds. Use CouchDB to store your app, and you because the admin sort of. I mean, the admin will write to the database, but just the the user management and that sort of stuff generally prefers the SQL database there. Um, I'm sure that if you've hacked it enough, you could probably get it working. But uh, um, yeah, so. Just to be extra safe. Uh, so one other thing that I should show you here. As I said before, you can store your views on the file system. That goes in a folder called design slash views slash and then you set up your various views. So here's that speaking one I've been demoing. Uh, exactly the same, you just sort of just make sure it goes into a special folder and it will pick it up. Or we've got one that just emits the document ID and the document so we can view every single one of them. And All going well, nothing will blow up. There we go. So we've got this extra line here for those who run SyncDB quite regularly. We've got this extra line that says Django example created in CouchDB. We go back to Couch, refresh, and now we have our event. The thing that we do also have <laughs> is those two. Uh, views on the file system that we define. So it sort of lets you self-contain your entire application inside Django and CouchDB will take care of the rest for you. If we then Very simple app. Document. 
I mean, very little code was needed there. It's all handled for you through Calcimia Kit. If we So what, what's happening there is it's just, it's calling the view speaking. So anything that has a type of speaker, it emits that out to uh, the, the Django iterator. And then we simply just iterate through each of those. And that's as simple as that. It just, it, it just works with Django. It's quite good. Um, that's it. Any questions? Please repeat the question. Is there any questions? No, when they... Oh, yes. Yep. Is it possible to, to um, like freeze the data? Sorry, sorry. You can take a snapshot off it off a file system. Yeah. Um, as for freezing it, I'm not 100% sure. Uh, yeah, uh, no, it doesn't really offer that sort of consistency there. It, yeah. I don't think so. Like it, it uses MVCC to sort of offer the, the same sort of guaranteed isolation, I guess. Um, so it, yeah, instead of instead of freezing a particular, because it doesn't lock, instead of freezing a particular row, it just creates a new one. And when it knows that it can, it will update the revision to point to that new one. As I said before, if that revision never gets updated, something goes wrong, it just deletes that record off. And it, it, it's as if it never existed. So that answer your question. Yeah, <laughs> like, does it can it can it can you benefit from garbage collecting in conditions? Yeah, yeah. You, so you, you can do it in one of two ways. You can tell it never to co to collect it, or, or you can provide your own function that says you know what to do under these circumstances. So pretty much anything, anything it does automatically can be overwritten with your own. You can write a JavaScript function that will tell it, you know if it came from this database, then prefer that when you're replicating. Uh, <laughs> Any merge conflicts will also exist in the database, so you can come through later and pull them up if you need to. You can see what, when it made that consensus decision, you can see what got favor there. Um, so it, it's all there, it's just up to you to figure out how you want to use it. Yeah, nothing, nothing gets deleted until it decides to compact everything. says down there everyone is an admin, um, you, you can create a, a, a server admin. Um, and then you use, like, I'm pretty sure you use standard HTTP authentication or you can provide your own mechanisms to make sure that no one's writing. Um, I don't think you're gonna get a strong, uh, oh, uh, a user permissions as you will on a standard SQL server, but um, yeah, it is there. That's a good question. I have no idea. It seems a bit um, open. Yeah, you, you can configure it. You can lock it down. Um, I, it, I don't think it's trying, like, it's not trying to enter the same realm as, uh, like, MySQL and Oracle. Uh, I think it's trying to serve two different purposes here. Um, I guess I figure if you write an app where all the business logic was in JavaScript in the browser <coughs> and it was talking directly to CacheDB, then yeah. I guess yeah, yeah. it would curl. No, no, you can definitely lock it down to what extent. I'm not 100% sure there. I've never written anything extensive on top of it. Are there any really large installations out in the wild? You know, multi hundred gigabyte. Uh, yeah, Zenga. Zenga, the uh, Facebook game platform, they use it extensively. Um, and they're, they're a company that can deal with like millions of writes a second. Um, so, yeah, they, they do exist. Uh, yeah, the other two one. Uh, not Amazon, the other one. There are, there are lots of them out there. Uh, they're not public, but they do use it sort of as their, their back end. Uh, 
the story goes that Zenga were kind of up in the air and some of the couch, uh, uh, couch TV guys went in and sort of wowed them. What they did is they took their, they unplugged the network cable, sat there and watched it. They watched it, wait till the disk spooled up and then plugged it back in and then they just watched it flood the network and replicate across the database without missing a beat. And they were quite impressed with that. It's just ridiculously, uh, just how ridiculously easy it is to replicate without, with zero data loss.